It's an election year on both sides of the pond, and the decision on who will lead is being strongly shaped by the youngest generation of voters, Gen Z. As a result of growing up with the internet, they have access to more information and resources. They navigate social media platforms, share information instantaneously, and mobilize quickly on important issues like climate change, racial justice, and gun control. And in English-speaking countries like the US and Great Britain, they don't hesitate to use their power at the polls. But although Gen Z is being purported to be both progressive and pro-government, this narrative is being challenged, particularly in Europe. From Germany to France, Finland to Spain, the far right has made inroads in the youth vote in key states in the latest EU election, catapulting their parties to capture one in four seats in Brussels, as a generation that has grown up amid constant crises, seeks new answers, and follows politicians fluent in TikTok and YouTube. So is the true story about the arrival of Gen Z into our politics one about young people hungry for progressive political change? Or a generation that is driving governments in a decidedly far-right direction? And what does that mean for tomorrow's political landscape on both sides of the Atlantic? Well, let's take a look. Gen Z, the young and dynamic cohort between the mid-1990s and early 2010s, is driving a generational inflection point in the US and European politics. As a group, these tens of millions of young voters face risks that older generations could scarcely imagine. Extreme economic inequality, climate change, and warp speed technological change that's shaking political and economic stability in the United States and much of the world. They have endured the longest war in modern history, and crisis after crisis, first the financial, then the Eurozone, then the pandemic, and now a war in Europe. Yet these voters are more diverse, more tech-savvy, and they've contributed forcefully to social and climate justice movements. And they've emerged from the crucible of these experiences decidedly more egalitarian. They have a more critical view of the flaws in our democracy and have a more progressive standpoint on the distribution of wealth and income inequality. And by some measures, millennials and Gen Z voters by 2028 will account for half of the electorate and millions of young Gen Zers will be eligible to vote for the first time this year. And this specific generational cohort has a pretty distinct demographic than from older generations. In the US, for instance, about half of Gen Z is non-Hispanic white, compared to more than seven in 10 baby boomers. And in Europe, although the same racial markers aren't used to track census information like we do, uh, we do know that Gen Z is the most diverse generation in the European Union in regards to national origin. In Europe generally, 13.9% of those aged 14 and younger in 2019, which by the way includes Gen Alpha, were born in another EU member state, and 6.6% .6 were born outside the EU. And religious composition differs widely as well. In the US, more than one in three Gen Z adults identifies as religiously unaffiliated, roughly twice as many as baby boomers. A similar trend in many European countries where such a secular trend amongst Gen Z is pronounced, with nations like the Netherlands and Sweden experiencing a striking 50% decline in religious affiliation when comparing Gen Z with the baby boomers. And last but not least, Gen Z adults are about five times as likely to identify as LGBTQ. And that's true regardless of which side of the Atlantic you're living on. But generational differences extend beyond demographics. Compared to previous generations, Gen Z is more likely to have been raised in a smaller family by older parents who are spending more time outside of the home. Census data across OECD nations show that in two-parent households, young adults today are far more likely to have both parents working full-time, a shift from previous generations. And these generational differences profoundly shape the way in which Gen Z views the world and ultimately, their political participation. 
Turnout amongst young voters has broken records in the past three election cycles, with Gen Z voters helping Democrats to recapture Congress in 2018, reclaim the White House in 2020, and maintain control of the Senate in 2022. And the 2019 EU election turnout amongst young people set records with young citizens under 25 years of age, seeing a 14 percentage point gain over previous elections. This political activism and participation amongst Gen Z was further invigorated this year when, importantly, for the first time, all citizens over the age of 16 were eligible to vote in Austria, Belgium, Germany, and Malta, and all citizens over the age of 17 in Greece, opening up the elections to young voters even further. Now, in Europe at least, it's still a little bit too early to discuss the EU election with specificity and certainty because their official report by the EU Commission doesn't usually come out until September. But what we do know is that 64% of young people expressed their intention to vote in the latest Eurobarometer. The figure has gone up considerably in some areas. In Denmark, for instance, 82% of young people surveyed were planning on voting. An increase in turnout, however small, could suggest that young Europeans have remained engaged in the continent's elections. Contemporary political leadership is fearful of TikTok's influence, but young people increasingly see it as a key platform for learning about and spreading political ideas. But will TikTok get young people engaged in the 2024 elections or serve as another distraction? And how can you tell if the information you're watching is factual and unbiased? That's why I always use our sponsor, Ground News, because they give me an easy and data-driven way to read the news. On Ground News, every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of political bias, factuality, and the ownership of sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. For example, this recent story on the Biden campaign joining TikTok in a push for young voters was covered by 158 news outlets and I've been using their new comparison feature to see specific differences in left and right reporting. For this story, a left-leaning outlet highlighted the platform's significance and Biden's dropping approval ratings with young Americans, while a right-leaning outlet slams the action as desperate and a double standard, given the highly publicized national security concerns and the platform being banned on federal devices. If one side of the political spectrum is ignoring a story, the blind spot feed will let you know so you can make up your own mind about how reliable the reporting is. Which is a level of transparency I very much appreciate when researching different topics and looking through the data for stories that I cover here on my channel. So if you want to give Ground News a try, be sure to click the link down below in the description of this video or head over to ground.news forward slash Ashton. You can subscribe through my link to get 40% off the Vantage subscription, which includes unlimited access to all of their amazing features. Plus, when you subscribe, you're not just supporting me, but an independent platform trying to make the news more transparent. A pretty consistent trend through much of the Western world since World War II is that older generations typically tend to have higher political participation, and they usually vote more right-leaning or conservative. According to Ipsos polling, people are more likely to vote when they have more at stake, such as children to raise, homes to maintain, and income taxes to pay. And this generational gap of political positions could be due to the fact that today's youths grew up in different socio-political environments to their parents and grandparents, environments which make them more likely to go to university, correlating with socially liberal views on certain issues. Millennials are also the first generation to own less than their predecessors at the same age, and with Gen Z exhibiting similar trends, economically redistributive policies tend to be popular with them. Even young conservatives are still found to hold more liberal views on things like racial equality, climate change, universal health care, and abortion than previous generations. And this could be due, in part, to the fact that Gen Z voters are actually less likely to register with conservative parties, even if they themselves grew up in conservative households. Take the U.S., for example. Recent data finds that Gen Z adults are more likely to identify as Democrats than Republicans or independents. Moreover, Gen Z men are more likely to identify themselves as liberal than conservative. The same study also found that three in four Gen Zers, including the majority of Gen Z Republicans, back government relief from student loan debt, 
Along with millennials, Gen Z Americans are far more supportive of government action to address climate change than older Americans. The majority of Americans under the age of 30 believe that policing and prison systems need to be completely rebuilt in order to ensure racial equality, rates higher than older Americans. And the same appears to be true in the United Kingdom as well. Data from the Resolution Foundation and the British Election Survey places the economy at the top of Gen Z's voting concerns, far higher than other generations. Conversely, immigration is a minor concern. The NatSend data shows Gen Zs are willing to break laws they don't agree with, support liberal drug policies, and oppose punitive criminal justice. They also typically want a more progressive approach to supporting adult social care and are the generation which is the most likely to support the idea that those with the most money pay the most taxes. And these views help to explain why both the US and the UK, both millennials and Gen Z, are actually getting more left-wing as time goes on. And this momentum was definitely carried over in Labour's landslide victory in the latest election earlier this month. But things are different in mainland Europe, where right and far-right parties are surging amongst the Gen Z demographic. Young voters across Europe are veering towards newer parties, which include far-right platforms, whereas many long-established centrist parties still rely on support from older voters. In Belgium, France, Portugal, Germany, and Finland, younger voters are backing anti-immigration and anti-establishment parties in numbers equal to and even exceeding older voters, in the Netherlands, Geert Wilders, anti-immigration far-right freedom party, won the 2023 election on a campaign that tied affordable housing to restrictions on immigration, a focus that struck a chord with young voters. In Portugal too, the far-right party Chega, which means enough in Portuguese, drew on young people's frustration with the housing crisis, among other quality of life concerns. And data from numerous studies suggest that the leftist Greens, which typically relied on young voters for their popularity, is slipping. In Finland, the nationalist Finns party was the most popular party amongst 18 to 29 year olds, according to a 2023 survey, which found that over a quarter of the potential first time voters surveyed expressed their intent to vote for the populist right wing opposition party. That's eight points ahead of the second-placed Greens. And it's a similar story in Italy, too, where the ruling right-wing Fratelli d'Italia were actually quite popular amongst young voters. A poll just before the 2022 election found that Maloney's party was the most popular party amongst 18 to 21-year-olds, with 23% support, closely followed by another right-wing party, Lega, with 22%. And take a look at what's happening right here in the country where I live in Germany, in the most recent round of EU elections, saw a sharp shift to the far right and away from liberal left and pro-climate parties. The anti-immigrant Eurosceptic Alternative for Germany, or AFD, emerged from the elections with the second largest German representation in Europe. Some 16% of all young voters aged 16 to 24 voted for the AFD. Around three times as many as five years ago, only 11% of this cohort voted for the Greens, who are part of Germany's ruling federal coalition. That's a 23% reduction compared to the last election in 2019, when the voting age was still 18. And while this shift to the right is definitely remarkable, we should actually enter in the caveat that it might not actually be necessarily that the AFD is getting really, really popular. And that's what's leading to their growing influence in German politics. It's just that the AFD in Germany doesn't necessarily even have to grow to become the largest party in the Bundestag, because the SPD and the Christian Democrats, the traditionally largest parties in Germany, are shrinking. And Gen Z voters, as you can see here, are actually scattered across lots of different parties. But I also think that Gen Z highlights a pretty significant misunderstanding of far-right politics. Particularly, I think we might be just too reductionist in who we think far-right voters are. For instance, here in Europe, being alt-right or far-right doesn't necessarily mean the exact same thing as it does in Europe, 
versus the United States. The first thing you'll notice when you compare American and European political parties is that there are more of them that matter in the latter. Unlike in the US and the UK, where you're left out in the cold if you don't pitch a big enough tent, European countries tend to be more pluralistic with many more options to choose from. The right-wing parties that I've discussed today tend to have an anti-establishment vibe to them. And unlike the US and the UK, where third-party options are so fringe that they aren't really an option at all, in the EU, you actually can stick it to the system by voting for one of these anti-establishment parties and actually make an impact on the outcome of an election. And so that, coupled with the fact that political parties just in general tend to be more left-leaning in Europe, means that we really can't line them up in neat little pairs when we do comparisons between the US, the UK, and the rest of the European Union. But an easy comparison here would be, obviously, between MAGA supporters of Trump and the AFD party here in Germany. When you look at their stance on things like fear of immigrants and foreigners, check. Hostility towards the European Union, check. Contempt for the standard operating procedure in government and willingness to gut the state apparatus, check. Open criticism to science-based public health measures, also check. But the AFD also supports things like building up Germany's public health care system, investing more in public pensions, and creating more affordable public housing, something that I think even center-leaning Republicans in the United States would probably like turn their nose up at. It really is difficult to draw like a one-to-one -one comparison between the Republicans and the far-right parties, especially here in Germany. So much of a nation's politics is a function of their historical geographical context, recently experienced national traumas, and so on. And so I do think this is an important caveat to include in this video. But beyond the parties themselves, in English-speaking nations like the US and the UK, right-wing politics are traditionally associated with rural or economically deprived regions and the swaths of voters who live there the places that were left behind by globalization, which is still true here in Europe as well. But right-wing politics are also showing much broader appeal, particularly within the upper echelons of society, a more affluent crowd that is somewhat pessimistic about the future, a future where they won't have enough money and won't be able to maintain the standard of living that they grew up with. Despite the support of right-wing parties in most European countries, Young people are more pro-immigration than older voters. They have not become xenophobic. Gen Z Europeans, by and large, have not moved rightwards on migration, abortion, minority rights. But far-right parties have convinced them that they are the ones that offer a credible economic alternative. In particular, an economic alternative that puts the needs of existing citizens before things like investment in foreign wars and refugee aid. And if you read a lot of the investigative journalism that's been done on many of the voters who chose to vote alt-right, these economic concerns are so great that they're willing to overlook some of the more fascist and racist undertones that the leadership might do or say. But these ultimately are just my observations as an outsider looking in on what's happening here in Germany because, well, I still can't vote here just yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> but I would really like to hear your thoughts and reactions on what you think is driving the popularity of alt-right parties, particularly amongst young voters here in Germany and quite frankly, throughout all of Europe, because this is becoming a pretty common phenomenon that we're seeing, especially during these highly contested elections. So please let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Cheers.